Dr. Klan is a professor of neuroscience and biology at New York University. Um, he received his PhD from Medical College of Virginia and did postdoctoral training at Baylor College. And um, he held previous faculty positions at the University of Pittsburgh and Baylor College of Medicine. And he will be talking to us about the molecular genetics of autism spectrum disorders. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, and thank, I thank Barry for the invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure. Uh, I actually enjoy speaking to a more diverse audience and trying, because I think sometimes we get stuck in the lab and we forget that what we do is supposed to improve the lives of the taxpayers who help fund our research. So I'm really happy to have the opportunity um, to tell you about um, just a couple of the projects that we've been working on. And I actually picked these two projects because um, I think they illustrate um, the serendipity of scientific discovery. So I'm going to tell you a little story about what I'm what, what my background is, what, what I'm interested in, but uh, we ended up getting uh, in, interested in uh, autism spectrum disorders and other types of neuropsychiatric disorders because of our work on basic uh, science type of questions. So um, I think that's one of the beauties of science is that you never know when you do an experiment how it's going to uh, turn out and where it will lead you in the future. <clears throat> so uh, historically, my lab is interested in molecular mechanisms that underlie complex behavior. So that's um, a very complicated question. And so um, our, our approach has been to um, use a reductionist approach in that we look for, let's say, for learning and memory in areas of the brain. Uh, this is a, a hippocampal slice. The hippocampus is involved in consolidation of a declarative memory, um, facts, um, places, et cetera. And um, we, we ask uh, when synapses are strengthened due to a particular type of activity that an animal uh, undergoes when it's exploring a novel environment, what are some of the molecular changes that um, are uh, involved in that activity dependent change in synaptic strength? And then we try to identify those and then ask, are those same molecular mechanisms then involved in um, behaviors that involve the hippocampus, so in, a, in the formation of memory. And we use um, genetics, so we use a lot of mice in which we can manipulate genes. We can either remove the genes, we can overexpress the genes, or we can mutate those genes to um, ask very specific questions about some of the molecules that we're interested in. And um, as I mentioned, one of the things we've been interested in for a long time is memory. And there's a process that we've been um, interested in, and that is how um, gene expression uh, in response to neuronal activity is regulated um, during uh, memory formation. And so all of you are familiar with this. So DNA uh, gets converted to RNA, which then gets converted to protein. So DNA to RNA, that's called transcription. Those transcripts are then processed into um, messenger RNA. And these messenger RNAs are transported to various places in cells and in neurons. They can be distributed all over the neuron, not just in the cell body, but also in the processes that come from neurons. Uh, and then that mRNA is translated into protein. And the proteins are um, uh, the building blocks of cells and help cells like neurons function in a particular way in response to various types of stimulation. So, I think this is actually a picture, a cartoon diagram of a mRNA with a ribosome on top of it. And a ribosome is a molecular machine that basically takes that information that's coded in the mRNA, which it got from the DNA, and then uh, takes amino acids based on that um, uh, uh, um, information and makes this protein made up these long chains of amino acids. Okay. So, um, and we were interested in this process because for probably 50 years, it's been known that in order to convert short-term memory to long-term memory, you need to stimulate new RNA and new protein synthesis. And so um, for probably 15 years ago, we've been interested in the molecular signaling mechanisms that regulate protein synthesis during the consolidation of long-term memory. Now. Uh, I've told you how um, gene expression starts, uh, and it ends with the synthesis of protein. So this is the ultimate step in gene expression. And 
And protein synthesis itself is a very complex type of um, process. It has three stages. Uh, the first is the initiation, and this is where the ribosome fights, finds the sequence that tells it to start and to make uh, a polypeptide chain or an amino acid chain to make a protein. Uh, then there's the elongation, so that's as the ribosome scans down that sequence and adds amino acids along. And then when it comes to a, a, a sequence that tells it to terminate, it stops the uh, synthesis of the protein so that now you have this kind of fully functional uh, protein. And um, each of these steps, of course, is uh, complicated, but most of what we know about the regulation of uh, protein synthesis uh, takes place at the initiation stage. And I'm not going to go into this in detail right now, but I'm just going to tell you that most of what we know about how protein synthesis is regulated initiation is at this step, and that's where that messenger RNA actually um, uh, binds to the ribosome. Okay, So the ribosome binds to the mRNA, and it finds that start codon so that it can start making a polypeptide chain. Okay, so this is just one of the control mechanisms for that. And I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to explain this in detail because that would be uh, not really appropriate for this. But information, uh, so when a when a receptor on a neuron is stimulated by a neurotransmitter, it will end up stimulating this particular cascade of events. And the bottom line is I want you to focus on this particular factor right here. This is a translation factor or a protein synthesis factor called EIF4E. And what it does is it, it binds to the end of the messenger RNA. And normally when a cell is at rest, it's um, uh, dormant. That is, it's kept um, inactive by uh, proteins that repress uh, protein synthesis. And then during this activation, it's released from this kind of um, uh, inhibited state, and it's, uh, it, it, it will move to this other um, complex where it's active. Okay? And it's this step where the ribosome can then find the start codon so that, uh, so that the protein can be synthesized. So um, I'm summarizing probably about 100 years of postdoc and graduate student uh, work. But the bottom line is, is that this pathway, not surprisingly, is required for activity-dependent long-term changes in neuronal function and also for um, the formation of memories. And that's probably not surprising because I told you this cascade's involved in protein synthesis and it's been known for a long time that uh, protein synthesis is required for uh, long-term memory. Now, um, and we know this from doing pharmacological experiments that is using um, small molecules that can inhibit various steps in this cascade. We can do genetic manipulations to remove uh, steps that are required for this cascade. But uh, during the studies, and this is the serendipitous part and how we got interested in autism spectrum disorders, we, we were interested in what happens when you remove um, things that negatively regulate this cascade. So protein synthesis is really highly tightly regulated. It's involved in cell growth. So you could imagine that in cancers, this pathway is overactivated. So you want to have a very complex set of breaks at various, all these steps in order to keep the system uh, from going uh, too, too fast and, and producing um, cells that grow too much and divide too much. Okay, so um, what we thought in the nervous system is that if we remove these negative uh, regulators, uh, what we might see is that you might actually improve the memory of the mice. And what we found was it was actually the opposite. In most cases, when we move, remove negative regulators of this cascade, um, rather than improving the memory of the mice, because we'd be enhancing protein synthesis, we actually saw that they had impaired memory. Not only that, they, they exhibited a bunch of very strange behaviors, which I'm going to show you some in a minute, which we were not familiar with at the time. So they had... Um, what we would call behavioral inflexibility. They had stereotypic or repetitive types of behaviors. Okay, and uh, we were surprised by this. But at, at that time, there was all this genetic information that was coming out that showed us that mutations in various uh, genes that encode negative regulators as cascade were involved in these kind of single gene disorders that have um, a lot of degree of autism associated with them. Okay, so these are just some of them. Neurofibromatosis, 
uh, P10, uh, which is a mutation that gives rise to macrocephaly or big heads, so uh, which is also associated with autism spectrum. There's a, a mutations in these proteins gives rise to something called tubular sclerosis complex, and then uh, mutations in this protein um, give rise to fragile X syndrome, which is the single leading genetic known genetic cause of autism spectrum disorder. So what's interesting is each one of these mutations um, basically re results in over activation of this cascade and um, predicted to be exaggerated protein synthesis. So protein synthesis that's not regulated correctly. And um, what has been found, probably what's been studied the most, is fragile X syndrome. So, um, and these are some studies that have been done by Mark Baer as well as my lab, showing that when you um, uh, mutate or get rid of the protein that's uh, lost in fragile X syndrome, you see increased protein synthesis. And I'm not going to go through all these assays, but um, I'm just going to just say this in general. We don't know the identity of all these proteins yet, but we know that the general way in which protein synthesis is regulated is not taking place normally in fragile X syndrome model mice. Okay, so um, let's go back to this. So this is the molecular complex at the simplest level. This is that translation factor EIF4E. When it's bound to its repressor, um, translation or protein synthesis is off. And then when it's in this complex, um, tr uh, protein synthesis is on. So what we found was that in Fragile X syndrome, both my lab as well as um, Kim Huber's lab at UT Southwestern in Dallas, found that in Fragile X syndrome mice that instead of being uh, in this um, repressed state, there's more of this EIF4E in this um, on state, okay, consistent with there being increased protein synthesis. So um, that's all well and good, but that's really what we would call in our field correlative studies, right? We didn't really demonstrate um, that um, that change in protein synthesis is what gives rise to all this abnormal uh, function of neurons and abnormal behavior by these mice, okay? So what we'd really like to do is just directly ask that. And we were encouraged by this because when we started these studies, there was a, a genetic um, study that was published showing that mutations in uh, the gene that encodes for EIF4E were associated with autism. And so I won't go over the genetics for this, but this mutation happens in a region of the DNA in which um, promotes the expression of the gene, okay? And so uh, we, uh, in collaboration with uh, a group at uh, UCSF, uh, made uh, mice that overexpress uh, EIF4E, okay, that translation factor. So the only known function of this protein is to um, regulate protein synthesis. So we think that this was a good test of this idea that exaggerated protein synthesis might be this um, mechanism that links all of those disorders that I talked about. So, and, and the idea of this is um, really um, what I think is the promise of molecular me me medicine. So. In this case, you have a human uh, neurological disorder, psychiatric disease. You find the gene for, that's um, associated with this. Based on this, you make a mouse model, or it could be a fly model, or a worm model. Uh, and then uh, what we do is we do basic neurobiology, but we also do uh, disease pathophysiology. And we do this at the molecular level, the synaptic level, that is the, at the level that the neurons communicate with each other, and at the behavioral level. And what we try to do is, based on what we know about the basic neurobiology, is really try to identify, especially at the molecular level, what the changes are. And the idea is that if we know what the molecular basis of that change is, then we can use a targeted um, identification and drug development, and then uh, this will give rise to novel therapeutics that you could then be put back into the clinic to, to do this. And that, I'm not going to talk anymore about fragile X syndrome, but this is basically the pathway that's been taking place in Fragile X syndrome. And there's a num number of drug trials, um, probably the first one for an autism spectrum disorder, that are going underway that are based on this kind of approach for an autism spectrum disorder. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to go over this, but I'm just going to show you this is a readout of protein synthesis. And 
And in these mice that overexpress that uh, protein synthesis factor, there's just more protein synthesis, and that's really all you need to know here. So we're happy about that, so now we can directly test the hypothesis. So the question you're probably asking is, well, how do you model autism in a mouse, right? Autism, like schizophrenia and some other neuropsychiatric disorders, is a very human type of disorder, right? And so what are some of the hallmarks of the disorder? So, of course, there's impaired um, social behavior, okay? There's um, repetitive behaviors or restricted interests. So when I mean this, there's kind of stereotypic repetitive behaviors like um, hand-wringing or, or flapping or something like that. But there's also um, repetitive behaviors that are more cognitive, and we would call those behavioral inflexibility, and I'll give you some examples of that in a minute. And then, of course, in full-blown autism, there's a lack of communication skills. And it turns out that uh, for sure for social behaviors and for these types of behaviors, you can model these in rodents, including mice. Um, it turns out rodents are very social animals, and they um, um, can be made to exhibit these types of behaviors. And it turns out um, mice also um, can communicate using vocalizations. They're called ultrasonic vocalizations. And there are a lot of people that study mouse models of autism that that measure these types of um, events. And we, I'm not going to show you any of that today. Um, it's something we also do, but I'm not going to show you. But rather, I'm going to talk about some of these be types of behaviors, these repetitive behaviors and restricted interest behaviors, as well as social behaviors. So we have this mouse. It overexpresses a protein that gives rise um, to exaggerated protein synthesis. That's something that occurs in a number of these other monogenetic um, disorders, monogenic. Okay, so what about repetitive behavior? So mice like to dig, okay? So one of the tests that people do is something very simple called marble bearing behavior. So you just have a mouse in a cage and you have 20 marbles and you just put them in there with the marble and leave it alone and they like to dig and bury these marbles and come back 30 minutes later and you ask, how many marbles did the mice bury, okay? And this is uh, marbles buried versus time and you can see really rapidly there's a big difference, uh, almost a doubling in the number of marbles that the, the mutant mice um, uh, uh, bury compared to their normal wild type litter mates shown here. So I actually have a movie and I'm going to see if you can pick out the normal wild type mouse and the mouse that overexpresses the translation factor. This is sped up, they don't quite move this fast. Okay, so this is a normal mouse, and these are two mutant mice. Okay, and so they have they have this really noticeable re repetitive behavior. So what other types of kind of stereotypical behaviors? Um, so one of the things is grooming behavior. So mice normally groom themselves, but a, a stereotypic type of behavior will be excessive grooming, where they're always using their paws and and kind of barbering themselves and 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 uh, doing this, and so. In this type of behavior, when we can, when we videotape it and measure it, um, these mice spend more time um, grooming themselves in the normal mouse. And you can see actually sometimes evidence of this. So here's a normal a wild type mouse shown here. And you hear, I don't have a movie, but you can see that this little guy has basically removed all the hair from his face. Okay, so this is a very good example of a kind of stereotypic repetitive uh, behavior. Okay. And what about a more cognitive type of um, um, repetitive behavior? We would call this restricted interest or behavioral inflexibility. And we model this using a really kind of simple uh, task. This is a, a, a Y maze, and it's a water-based Y maze. And so what you do is you have a mouse, you put it in the water, and it's shaped like a Y. And at one arm of this Y, there's a hidden platform. So mice are desert animals normally, and they don't like to be in water. So when you put them in water, they swim around and they try to find a way out. Okay, so you don't, have to, you don't have to motivate them to do this. They do it really easily. And so this is a pretty simple task because it only can choose to go either here or here. And so based on thing, um, cues that we put on the wall, the animal will learn that when it's in this type of maze during the training that it has to turn right to get out of, 
get out of the platform. So once it reaches the platform, we immediately take it out. So um, this is the number of training blocks. There's five trials per training block, and once they reach uh, four out of five or 80 percent, we we consider they've learned the task. And basically, you can see these mice compared to their um, normal litter mates, they learn this task just fine. And then what we do is we take them out of doing this once we've con convinced ourselves they've learned it, and we put them back in their home cage, and then we bring them back the next day, and we ask, do you remember that when we put you in this water, you need to go up to this point and turn right? And these mice can do that. So that these mice aren't dumb. They can learn things, and they can remember things just fine. Okay. So once we convince that they both can learn and remember this, then what we do is we immediately put the platform in the other arm. And what we do is ask them, how long does it take them now to take this new information and layer it on top of what they learned before? And when they go down there, they say, hmm, the platform's not there. I need to have another strategy. I need to go somewhere else and then learn this. And so this is, as you can see, it takes them a little longer to do this. So this is a normal mouse. You can see that it takes them a number of more trials in order to get this correct. But um, what you'll notice is that these mice that have the exaggerated protein synthesis, it takes them much longer to do this. Okay? Okay, so that's um, our um, repetitive and uh, behaviors and restricted interest for these mice. What about their social behaviors? So we um, do a number of different types of social um, behavioral tasks. And one that we use a lot is a, a three-chamber social task. And so this is based on the idea that a mouse normally would like to interact with a mouse rather than an inanimate object. So you have a, a chamber and two doors uh, on either side of this chamber that lead to these other chambers. In one chamber, you have a mouse. In another chamber, you have an inanimate object. And you just lift the door, and you ask, how uh, much time does the mouse spend with the mouse versus this in inanimate object? And normal mouse will spend more time with the mouse, not the object, whereas these mouse models of autism spectrum disorder will ha either have reduced or no preference. And so when we do this kind of test, uh, I'll just draw your attention here. This is the interaction time. And the bars here are the wild type mouse. And you can see that this, this normal mouse will spend almost 80, per, uh, or 80 seconds versus 20 seconds of time uh, with uh, the, mouse, the mouse versus the object. But if you look at the mutant mice, you can see they really don't have a preference for either the mouse or the object, okay? So um, we think that these, these mice actually exhibit a couple of behaviors that are consistent with what we would expect in individuals with autism. That is, they have impaired social behavior and they have repetitive behaviors and restrictive interests. And so based on that um, schema that I showed you about molecular mechanism, now we know that in these mice, there's more of this protein, so there's more of this complex. And so what we'd like to know is if we have a drug that interferes with this uh, uh, complex and pushes this back to this direction, can we correct the behavior? So we have this compound, and we've used this for a number of years for other studies, uh, and we can um, infuse this into the brains of these animals. And um, basically, what I'm going to show you is a movie um, showing these mutant animals, one of them has the drug, and the other uh, two here have just um, uh, the vehicle solution that the drug is in, so they don't have drug. So you can remember what those mouse looked like in this digging behavior before. Okay, so... You can see here that after about three or four days of this treatment, um, this, is the, tr this is what the mutant mouse on the drug looks like, and it looks just like the wild-type mice, whereas here um, they're still burying the marbles. These are mice that didn't have the drug. Okay, so we think we have a, a target where we can now use this not only uh, for these mice, uh, but also for some of those other uh, mutants uh, that I discussed uh, that would be thought to have um, excessive protein synthesis. And we think this is important because misregulation of this pathway um, has been shown to be associated with a number of other um, disorders, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, and also in response to psychoactive drugs. So there's a lot of interest uh, in the field in uh, 
looking at compounds that block various aspects of this very complex machinery to see if it can reverse these kind of abnormal behaviors that are associated with all these disorders that fall on the autism spectrum. Okay, do I have a couple more minutes? Okay. So um, I'm just going to tell you about one further study, and this is the um, just briefly, and this is, again, one of these serendipitous findings that I um, find ama amazing in science. So um, as I said, we study regulation of protein synthesis in the context of learning and memory. And um, there's another step involved in that, and this is first step in trans uh, protein synthesis initiation, which is here. I'm not going to go into the details uh, in great length, but this is controlled by uh, this um, uh, 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 protein synthesis factor, EIF2. And um, it's phosphorylated. That is, these, these enzymes called protein kinases can put phosphate group on this protein, and it changes the function. And so when this is phosphorylated, you see decreased protein synthesis, but there's increased um, protein synthesis of certain types of mRNAs, and I won't go into that. Um, we were interested in studying um, one of these uh, mice, uh, or one of these proteins, and I'll just uh, call it, it's called PERC. And so what it normally does is put a phosphate uh, group on this protein, okay? And normally, that would shut down protein synthesis. So again, it's a negative regulator of protein synthesis. So uh, these mice we made, uh, um, if you knock out this protein all over the animal, the animals die uh, before birth. And so we have to use a, a, a genetic manipulation where we just knock it out in the brain uh, after the animals start to develop. And so uh, these mice have a, a brain-specific deletion of this protein. And um, what we found with this, and this again was surprising, we wanted to study normal learning and memory in this mice. And it turns out the mice can learn and remember just about any task that we, we, we gave them. But what they can't do is the kind of reversal learning that I told you about before. So remember that task I told you, this water-based Y maze. So these mice can learn this task fine. They can remember this task fine. But even more so than the other mutant mice that I showed you, these mice basically can't do this test. Okay? They, you could give them trials forever, and they can never figure out that they need to turn left now instead of turning right. And so um, my graduate student who did this work Mimi Trin decided she would just block off this arm with a physical barrier and force the animals to go to the left. And even with that, it took them um, as long as, the, as their normal wild type um, litter mates to do this. And I'm just going to show you this movie. So this is um, an example of what the behavior of these animals look like. So here's a wild type mouse. And this is the 30th trial on that reversal learning. You can see it finds that hidden platform fine. So here's the mutant mouse, okay? And here's that physical barrier, okay? So the platform used to be here, but now it's here. And this mouse is completely behaviorally inflexible. It really wants to go to the left. I mean, it actually hits its head on the divider over and over again because it wants to go left and not to the right. Um, it, it'll get the kind of idea that, well, okay, I'm going to go back to where I started. Maybe I could get out there. Nope. Maybe I could go up there. I don't want to go up there. I want to go here. Right? So um, I studied mutant mice a long time. I've never seen a behavioral <laughs> um, effect like this. Um, and, and this is in a range of tests. We can train them to do just about anything. But um, when we try to get them to take, uh, uh, to modify their behavior, based on some kind of manipulation that provides new information, they can't do it, okay? So um, it turns out that um, these mice have a number of phenotypes that are, um, are, are behavioral abnormalities that are consistent with schizophrenia. And so what Mimi did was she treated these mice for two weeks with an antipsychotic. And I'm just going to show you a movie. Now this is a 21st trial. Remember what that mouse looked like before. And now it can find the platform just fine. So we can basically cure this mouse of its behavioral inflexibility by treating it with an antipsychotic. So um, uh, what Mimi then went on to do is she, she got human um, prefrontal cortex, that's the front of your brain, that would be. 
kind of year uh, that con controls kind of complex human behaviors. And what Mimi found was when she looked at the levels of this protein in the brains from these um, schizophrenic patients, um, there was less of this protein than in the normal patients. Okay, so that doesn't mean that this causes schizophrenia, but it means that it's a potential thing that's associated with schizophrenia. And then if you can manipulate, again, some of the signaling involved here, that you might be able to reverse some of these um, very severe behavioral um, abnormalities. So with that, whoops, I didn't want to skip, skip that far ahead. Uh, I'll just stop and um, thank you for your time. So this is uh, a relatively recent picture of my lab group. And um, I'll just point out uh, three of the people. Uh, Emmanuel Santini, who's a postdoc who did uh, most of the work on the first part uh, of the, the EIF4E mutant mice. Uh, and she did help, had help with a, a graduate student called uh, whose name is Ta Hun. And then Mimi Trins, a former graduate student who did all the work on the um, PERC mutant mice. And I uh, just thank my collaborators and then the people that fund our work, and I'll stop there. Thank you.